The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Welcome from the General Assembly and the City of Richmond. I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports and Cox Communications. We are pleased to have a very special guest this morning, one of four physicians in the General Assembly, Delegate Chris Stolle from Norfolk and Hampton Roads. Welcome, sir. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I think uh, there have been about 2,000 bills introduced so far in this 2013 uh, short session, and I think we have about 32 days left, and there are a lot of issues on the table, not the least of which affects Hampton Roads and Norfolk, and that's transportation. Can you give us the lay of the land? Sure. Um, transportation, of course, is a very big issue across the state. I think it's particularly a big issue in Hampton Roads because of our unique um, issues that we have, the bridges, the tunnels. It's just more expensive to build projects in Hampton Roads than it is in other parts of the state. And we have about $10 billion worth of projects that are just in Hampton Roads that we need to have done. We've seen the governor's uh, proposal for a statewide uh, solution, which um, I, everybody, I think, agrees is fantastic that we're looking at a statewide solution. I, with the other members of the um, General Assembly um, from Hampton Roads, have submitted a bill that if the governor's bill were not to pass, there still would be a bill for Hampton Roads to start funding some of those projects. Uh, it's the 1450 is the uh, House version of the bill. Senator McWaters is ca carrying the Senate version, identical language uh, for the bills. What the Hampton Roads bill does is essentially it sets up a referendum for the folks to vote on. The vote will be the next election, November of uh, 2013. It's a 1% sales tax uh, for Hampton Roads. That money will be used exclusively for transportation projects within Hampton Roads. So it would be under a lockbox, so to speak. It will be under a lockbox. There will be a special non-reverting fund set up within the state treasury to hold that money, and it can only be used in Hampton Roads. And tell us a little bit more about the unique needs of Hampton Roads. I think anybody that's out on the roads on a Friday um, afternoon, or really any afternoon, understands the backup that you get on both sides of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. The downtown tunnel, the midtown tunnel, even the high-rise bridge starts to back up. Monitor Merrimack is even beginning to back up. You essentially can't get in and out of Hampton Roads um, without crossing a body of water in, in some way. Uh, of course, that means that we're the greatest port in the world, um, greatest deep water port in the world, uh, brings a lot of assets, uh, the, the military, large military base in the world, uh, uh, the Panama, uh, Panamax ships that start in 2016. Um, so it brings a lot of business revenue. The flip side of it, it makes transportation very, very difficult. And from time to time when there's a, a very hard rain, those, those tunnels tend to flood, do they not? Certainly any time we have a storm that comes in, even with high, wane, uh, high winds, uh, 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 Virginia Department of Transportation is required to shut down the tunnels. And we can actually, on the south side, can be locked into to Hampton Roads uh, fairly early into a storm. Now, you mentioned the Panama Canal, and there's new construction going on there, which will allow very large container ships through the canal, which will increase uh, traffic at Hampton Roads, will it not? Um, absolutely, and again, we're very fortunate in that we have the deepest um, draft channels on the East Coast. And uh, Hampton Roads, uh, Norfolk, is the only port that can uh, now handle these uh, Panamax ships that will come through in 2014. The other ports are trying to catch up. They're dredging. Uh, they want this business too, but, but we have an inherent advantage, at least a very short inherent advantage uh, as we move forward. Part of that is, is that we have to get that cargo in and out of Hampton Roads as well. It's not just getting it to Hampton Roads, it's getting it out of Hampton Roads uh, to the rest of the country. Sure. Now, I, uh, back to your referendum, uh, mm -hmm. if my memory serves me correctly, there was a similar attempt at a referendum about 10 years ago. Uh, why do you think uh, uh, the voters will respond affirmatively this time? You know, 10 years ago, and uh, actually I think it's probably 
getting close to 11 or more years ago so. now that uh, that came up. I think people were being told, you know, if we don't do something about the roads, we're going to have a real problem here in another 10 years or so. Well, it's another 10 years or so down the road, and we have a real problem with our roads. And as much as I would love to have a statewide solution, if a sl statewide solution doesn't come through, I don't think we as an area can wait any longer to fix our roads. We're losing jobs. Um, the military said they're not bringing another position to Hampton Roads until we get the traffic under control. And so it's going to be a significant economic impact on Hampton Roads if we don't start fixing our, our transportation. There have been a number of public-private partnerships uh, throughout the state, one of which caused a little bit of discussion in the Hampton Roads area. Uh, how is that going now? Uh, I, I think that that uh, um, PPTA is, yes. is progressing the way that um, uh, it was originally envisioned. Uh, certainly the governor added some state money to uh, delay the start of the tolls on the uh, downtown and midtown tunnel. Uh, the money that would be raised by the referendum, by the sales tax increase, could be used to buy down uh, some of those tolls. The, how that money is spent is going to be determined by um, the uh, HRTPO, Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization, which is made up of the elected leaders um, throughout the uh, Hampton Roads area. The, the mayors uh, sit on there uh, as, long, as well as some members of the General Assembly. The projects that are prioritized within the HRTPO mm -hmm. will be the things that the money is spent on. And that's actually required by federal law. The federal law requires that any project in the area be in the HRTPO plan. And so having the HRTPO being the one responsible for that lockbox full of money ensures it's elected officials that are doing it, focusing on projects that um, help the entire Hampton Roads. Now, the, uh, the governor's proposal would eliminate the 17.5-cent uh, gas tax, mm -hmm. uh, accepting uh, diesel fuel. It would also raise fees on registration and fees related to vehicles that use alternative fuels, and it would rely more heavily on the sales tax. Uh, what kind of reception has that uh, gotten from your colleagues? Uh, I think that within the legislature, there's a pretty good understanding that the sales tax is not, or I'm sorry, the um, gas tax is not a solution moving forward for a, a number of reasons. Um, the sales tax with the new CAFE standards for cars um, going up to 54 miles per gallon, that's now the that minimum. Now that CAFE is a corporate average fuel economy, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Very nicely done. <laughs> um, as the fuel efficiency of cars increase, we're driving more miles, paying less tax. Um, the 17 cents was set in 1986, and the buying power of that 17 cents is about 40% now of what it was back in 1986. But we're driving more lane miles, driving more efficient cars. The, by executive order, the governor has ordered that state fleet be switched over to natural gas, which would mm -hmm. pay no gas tax but still use the roads. So that, along with a number of other reasons, make the gas tax not a viable long-term option. A lot of folks say, well, just add a penny or two um, to, the, to the gas tax. Well, to raise the same amount of money in Hampton Roads um, as the one penny sales tax would, you'd have to raise gas prices 25 cents. So it's not, a, it's not a penny or two, it's a significant increase. So I think this switch in the governor's plan from the gas tax to the sales tax uh, signals what we'll see across really the country as we move forward. What about the concern relative to uh, those visitors to the Commonwealth who pay a gas tax now and how we make up that difference? I think that uh, the um, data that will be coming, be coming in, I think we'll see some more data this week on that. Uh, there certainly are people that come in buy gas um, here in the, in the state of Virginia and don't buy anything else. However, a lot of the revenue that's generated from gas stations, from convenience stores, people come in, buy gas, and then they buy a number of other things. And we actually see that there are low price gas vendors around because they entice people in using low gas prices mm -hmm. knowing that they will come into the store and purchase other products. If you see the gas price go down significantly here in Virginia, that will entice even more people to come in 
for the gas and then spend dollars in other areas. Now I'm sure you're hearing about a, another major issue and that's the potential for lifting the moratorium on uranium mining. Talk to us about uh, what's going on in that area. Uh, I have not seen a bill on that yet. There's still lots of conversation that's going on uh, about uh, lifting the moratorium on um, uranium mining. I've come out opposed to that because uh, I don't see an upside for Hampton Roads. Um, you know, there has to be um, some assurances that our water supply won't be contaminated, that it won't impact the tourist business. And although I've seen some studies, I've had discussions with the folks um, out at uh, Coles Hill, um, I don't think the voters, the folks living in Hampton Roads, have been reassured enough that their water supply is 100% safe and it will not be contaminated by what's going on. So what are some of the bodies of water uh, in your district that could be adversely affected? Certainly uh, natural bodies of water in Hampton Roads won't, won't be affected at all. Our concerns are that um, we get, I believe it's about 60 million gallons a day from Lake Gaston. Mm -hmm. um, Lake Gaston uh, runs the risk of being uh, contaminated with a, what they call a 100-year storm, uh, a storm that would come along. You get into a lot of details of whether the tailings associated with the mining are above ground or below ground and whether they can leach into the groundwater and, and get transferred or, or if they're above ground, if they can actually get into the local water which would move to Lake Gaston. Hampton Roads is dependent, not just Virginia Beach, but Hampton Roads is dependent on that water coming in. It comes into Virginia Beach, it's shared with Norfolk, Norfolk distribu distributes that water to other cities within Hampton Roads. And so it's not just Virginia Beach that's, that's at risk, um, it's the entire Hampton Roads area that might be at risk. In any event, there will be a move to uh, lift the moratorium and, and create a regulatory regime, I, I take it. I believe that there will be at least discussions, the bill will move forward, and I don't know that it will be so much to lift the moratorium as to what criteria would need to be established for the moratorium to be lifted. If those criteria were uh, established, then the moratorium could be lifted. I, I think it gets to the same point where at some point you'd be doing uh, uranium mining. I think there's a lot more education that needs to be done before we're ready to do that. Uh, you mentioned 100 year storms, but there are storms every year in Virginia Beach as we know, and I know you have a, another piece of legislation dealing with sand replenishment. Anytime we get a nor'easter um, in Virginia Beach, the uh, the area I represent along Virginia Beach is along Chesapeake Bay, extending into Norfolk, a major portion of Ocean View, all falls within my district. All is at risk when we have these heavy storms. When Sandy came through, oh, probably close to two months ago now, um, we had significant erosion along some of the beaches. We know where that sand is going. Um, you know, it's not going that far. It's eroding off the beaches. It's putting homes and, and the public beaches that people enjoy at risk of being washed away. It's being taken a few hundred yards out and deposited in, on the um, uh, floor of the Chesapeake Bay. What this bill does is it streamlines the process to get a permit to get that sand off the, the floor of the okay. Chesapeake Bay and get it back up onto the, onto the beaches. We've been working uh, with uh, um, State Department's Department of uh, Environmental Quality. We've developed an uh, expedited process for approving those permits. Uh, a stakeholder team will get together, establish what needs to be done, and then once that's been expedited, limits to 90 days the permit process. Sometimes it can take up to two years. So two years? Two years wow. to get that permit. So, And then you have to get the permit again at each time that you want to do that dredging. So this permit will be um, in place for 10 years. So once you get it, expedited, is in place for 10 years and allows the city of Virginia Beach, or really any city that, that borders along the Chesapeake Bay, once the uh, sand deposits have been found, to move them back up onto the beaches. So I understand that, uh, that that bill will be on the floor of the House today. Correct. And so at 10 o'clock, you're going to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell us a little bit about uh, another bill that uh, you are, well actually it passed Friday I believe, but that's a bill de dealing with health care for seniors. Um, the, we uh, have a really critical shortage of geriatricians um, in Virginia, physicians who treat older adults. Everybody knows we use pediatricians for right. children and, and we have internal medicine and family medicine primary care doctors. 
But as we age, we have unique needs, just as young children have unique needs, older adults have unique needs, and sometimes the medicines aren't you want to use aren't the same, the combinations of the medicines you use aren't the same, and the folks that take care of those, those uh, the physicians who take care of those folks are geriatricians. We have a critical shortage across the country of geriatricians. As, we ha as our population ages, we simply don't have enough doctors to take care of uh, our aging population. Is that because th there's no interest in, in that area of practice or for other reasons? There are lots of reasons. It's not that there's no interest. I think there's a lot of interest um, in that area, particularly um, with the baby boomers aging. Mm -hmm. That interest is growing. The amount of research that's being done is growing. I think geriatrician is the only specialty that I've seen where you can um, receive training and earn less money. And mm. so if you're an internal medicine doctor, you agree to go get additional training to become a geriatrician subspecialist, you can anticipate that your reimbursement for treating older adults will be about $20,000 less a year. You'll earn wow. $20,000 less a year if you do that additional training. If you're a family medicine doctor and you do that additional training, you'll earn about $6,000 less a year. And so our payment system mm -hmm. um, is, is on its head. We reimburse high for things that we probably shouldn't be doing and low for things that we really should be doing. And, and whereas we're not going to be in a position to turn around the entire payment system of the country, we can try to provide some incentive for physicians to go in that training. And so what this, this uh, geriatrician bill does is it simply allows uh, geriatricians to be included with internal medicine doctors and family medicine doctors who, who agree to stay in the state and practice here to help repay some of the loans that they acquire as they go through uh, school, particularly the geriatrician training. Now, do they have to make a commitment to the Commonwealth in terms of how long they're going to practice here? They do. They have to, uh, for every year, they, or they have to make a commitment for two years here in the Commonwealth. Great. And again, that bill passed last Friday. Uh, congratulations. Is there a companion in the Senate, or will the Senate just take up your piece of legislation? Uh, the Senate will take up uh, my piece of legislation. We'll, we'll be able to defend it over, over there. So um, hopefully it will do as well over there as it did in the House. Great. Tell us a little bit about Eastern Virginia Medical School. Um, it, certainly uh, an absolute asset to uh, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, really the entire Hampton Roads area. If you look at the number of physicians that have gone through there and stay in the area, it's really dramatic. And, and that's, I think, something that people don't realize about having a medical school in your, in your mm -hmm. area is students tend to stay. And it's really helped um, the physician shortage throughout Hampton Roads. I know uh, I practice at a hospital in Newport News. We receive a lot of graduates from the residency programs and from um, EVMS who just want to stay in the area. So it's just not Norfolk. It's the entire Hampton Roads that benefits. I also happen to have a son there, so that's uh, um, uh, very proud uh, to have somebody uh, following in, in Dad's footsteps. But uh, it's an absolute asset to us. They were actually up visiting us uh, here in the General Assembly last Tuesday, I believe it was. Uh, they were coming around and meeting all the legislators, explaining some of the challenges that they have um, within medicine, within medical education at EVMS. And, uh, uh, anyone uh, that hasn't had a chance to go and look uh, at, uh, at what an uh, asset the EVMS is for this, the uh, uh, Hampton Road should really just take a look at their website. It's, it's remarkable. Now, just in terms of education in general, which is a core function of, of government, the, uh, the, the governor has placed a great emphasis on science, technology, engineering, math, and health. Mm -hmm. And, of course, our institutions of higher learning, uh, like your medical school, uh, is critical in that regard. Uh, talk to us about the education needs uh, statewide as well as well in the Norfolk and Hampton Roads area. Um, I'm very happy to be able to sit on the education committee, and I think that we have a number of education challenges, both through the K-12 and through higher ed. I think sometimes when we get into these discussions, we lose um, track of the fact that Virginia is a uh, fourth best K through 12 mm -hmm. education system in the nation. And some of our um, school districts arguably are the best school districts in the nation. And you can look at Virginia Beach, you can look at Fairfax, just uh, these are extremely good uh, school systems educating the kids very well. 
at the same time, we can look and say, we have some schools that are just failing, and we need to take additional steps to figure out how we can help those um, schools along. I did have the opportunity to sit down and talk with the superintendent of schools of uh, Norfolk uh, before this session, and we had a really good discussion um, asking, what tools do you need to help schools that are not doing as well? And he came up with some um, very basic, very straightforward things that you sit there and go, I, I think we can do that. Um, the first one was schools that are failing, um, they need to have the option of adjusting the calendar for those schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, perhaps it's a year-round school for a failing school may be what it takes, or just adjusting the school year or, or the gaps mm -hmm. in the school year. That authority should be with the people that we're holding responsible for the schools, and that's the superintendent and the school boards. So I think, number one, we give, for failing schools, the superintendent and school boards of those failing schools the ability to adjust um, that schedule. The second thing that uh, we talked about was the ability of um, school divisions to set up charter schools within mm -hmm. Uh, the public school system. And so the charter schools are set up and have slightly different regulatory responsibilities or requirements on them than the regular public schools. And so a public school system should be able to set up a charter school within a public school to target that education at particular uh, children who have a need. And so one of the governor's bills, I was very uh, happy to be carrying it this year, allows school districts uh, to take and set up charter schools within the public school system without um, Board of Education approval. It, it takes away that approval right. aspect from the, the Board of Education. The next thing that they talked about was the alignment of uh, early education, that we have some kids that are um, uh, kindergarten, pre-K, who are not uh, able to enter into pre-K or mm -hmm. they're not ready to enter into pre-K. And so we're looking at how we can maybe align the curriculum with Head Start program mm -hmm. with the pre-K and K program of Norfolk Schools to try and get those kids sort of a jump start and, um, into the pre-K and K program so that they're, they're actually ready to get into those programs and, and ready to learn. So that early childhood education is critical, especially in terms of, of what happens by the time a child is at the third grade level, for example. We've seen um, multiple, multiple studies that, you know, you can sort of begin to tell the outcome of a child's education by third or fourth grade. If a child is not reading by the end of third or fourth grade, that's a significant red flag. And so as best we can to take and prepare that child to move into the uh, early education period is really important. But also we need to identify those kids that are struggling early on and make sure that they get that additional help, not just mm -hmm. move them along, but make sure that they get that additional help in reading and in math before, before they move on. Now, with that flexibility for failing schools in terms of the school year, uh, they might want to adopt, require any changes in, in, in state law. I believe there's a law now that says you can't begin school until after Labor Day. There is a law that says that you can't uh, begin school until after Labor Day. For various reasons, about 72 of the 130 school mm -hmm. districts are excluded for, from that. I certainly understand the reason for that um, uh, school start date. I really want to try and get this bill away from that discussion because there, there are heated debates on both sides of that um, issue of when schools should start and when schools shouldn't start. I really don't want to look at this as a school calendar bill, this is a assistance see. to failing schools. I see. And whatever tools we need to give the superintendents, the school boards to help those failing schools, I think that's the direction. And, and we don't want to get pulled over into this, this fight of right. whether it should start in September or August. The question is, it may differ. Um, what the tools they need to get that school better is what we need to be working on. Now, as a member of the Health, Welfare, and Institutions Committee, I know you're confronted with this question of Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about the pros and cons of, of that issue. Certainly, very, very um, uh, tough uh, decision. You know, on the on the um, face of it, it looks like, uh, oh, gee, this is a no-brainer. This is free money from the from the federal government. Why wouldn't we just do this. We're, we're taking a program 
that fundamentally does not work very well now, uh, Medicaid program. It is a program that is reimbursing um, providers at 64 cents on the dollar. So um, it's not billed um, services, it's 64 cents of cost. Mm -hmm. So uh, the government, uh, state government sits down, calculates what it would cost me to see a patient in my office, and then provides me 64 cents on the dollar. There's not a business model in the world where a provider can stay in business and it doesn't matter whether you're making sandwiches or cars or providing health care. You cannot stay in business if you're getting reimbursed 64 cents on your cost. We're taking a program that's now reimbursing at 64 cents on the dollar of cost and expanding that to somewhere between 200 and 400,000 additional individuals. Mm -hmm. The way that that cost is offset is by private insurance. And so other folks' insurance goes up to offset the decrease mm -hmm. in payment on the Medicaid side. And so as we expand that Medicaid and the number of people being reimbursed at that lower level, costs are going to have to go mm -hmm. up for everybody else on, on the private insurance side in order to counteract that. Folks say the federal government's paying 100 percent. They're paying 100 percent of the 64 cents. They're not paying 100 percent of the cost. So when we say they're paying 100 percent, they're paying 64 cents of the cost of providing that, that care. And then that 100 percent drops off after three years to 90 percent and the state would have to take on that amount. We talked earlier about how the payment system was on its head yes. with the geriatricians. This is part of that payment system being on its head and, and the state has for years always relied on the private insurance to make up for that difference on underpaying for, for public insurance. And uh, there comes a point where the public insurance can no longer bear the cost of, of uh, propping up the, the public side. So before we expand Medicaid, I think that we need to have significant reforms of Medicaid and pr specific reforms of how we're going to take and make that system so that we provide better access at a better value to all the um, uh, taxpayers within the state. Great. Well, uh, in our remaining 30 seconds, I just want to thank you for being here and also uh, highlight your website, which has a wealth of information, which has a survey for your constituents and information about legislation regarding uh, your pro-business agenda. So thank you for being here, Delegate Chris Stolle. We appreciate your public service. Uh, my pleasure. I really enjoy it. Thanks very much, Woody. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.